Hello and welcome to Black Box. I'm Miles O'Brien. I've been a pilot for 33 years and a journalist covering aviation for 40 years. I'm Lars Perkins, and I've been a friend of Miles for 20 years, a pilot for 42 years. I'm a flight instructor. I've owned six aircraft, and accidents fascinate me. I read the reports incessantly. You try to learn from them as a pilot. And you always think when you're reading, like, wow, this guy made a really bad mistake. I could never do that. And that's actually not the case. Every pilot that we're going to talk about thought they couldn't do it, that it couldn't happen to them until the moment it did. We all say that and we're all dead wrong, in some cases, quite literally. You know, there is an expression in aviation. The rules are written in blood. There actually is a lot of truth to that. Over the years, aviation accidents and near accidents have taught us some hard lessons. And on Black Box, we want to unravel how that all happens, how the mysteries unfold, and how those solutions lead to safer aviation. Today, we begin with the deadliest single aircraft accident in aviation history. A single aircraft accident means that there's only one aircraft involved. It's not two crashing together on the runways in Tenerife, which is the worst aviation accident of all time. It's a single aircraft getting into a lot of trouble and where a lot of people paid the price. And there's a lot of really interesting and surprising aspects about the cause of the accident. What it seems to be at the outset and some of the ideas that were floated around turned out to be not the case. And it required some pretty interesting sleuthing on the scene in order to get to the root of it all. It also led to some of this is Japanese culture. The CEO of the airline resigned. Two relatively high-level managers involved in maintenance of the aircraft committed suicide. And it's a story that lives on 35 years later with live TV broadcasts of the annual commemoration ceremony. Amazing. Also, kind of a byproduct of Japanese culture. So there's this other expression in aviation. Accidents are like Swiss cheese. If you think about, you know, sliced Swiss cheese, when you look in the wrapper, every now and then you'll get a hole that goes all the way through the slices and you can see all the way through to the other side. And that's an important thing to remember. We tend to, in a simplistic way, want to point the finger at one individual or entity or event But seldom in aviation is it that way. It's a series of events, and this accident points that out in innumerable ways. Isn't that true, Miles? It's almost always a sequence of events. It's a cascade of different things. What the pilot did the night before, what the maintenance crew did a week or a month or a year before, or what the weather was on that particular day. Well, the key is, though, if you pull anything out of that mix, in other words, if you slide in another piece of Swiss cheese, all of a sudden the hole gets blocked. The accident doesn't happen. All those events have to happen in aggregate together in order for it to happen. And almost always, each of those individual events that you point out, if you pulled them out of the picture, no accident. And how many pieces of Swiss cheese do you think are involved in this one? This is one big stack of Swiss cheese. (laughs) We're going to go back to 1985, a hot August day, August 12th. Tokyo is the location. This is the story of Japan Airlines Flight 123. It's an accident that a lot of people in the West really are not very familiar with. But in Japan, it's a very different story. Everyone knows about it. It's kind of like a 9-11 event. Or it's like the Japanese Titanic. That's the way I've heard it described. It lives on in the memory of so many people. It's just a moment in history where there's this enormous tragedy. Whenever I get interested in pursuing a story in Japan, there's one person I call first every time. Fumio Asahi. Fumio is an outstanding journalist who has traveled the world covering all kinds of big stories. She was there in Tiananmen Square in 1989. She covered the democratization of Mongolia and the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. So when she says, I'm a freelance journalist, translator, and coordinator. She is adhering to Japanese customs of modesty. 
I met her 10 years ago when I went to Japan a few months after the Tohoku earthquake and the tsunami and subsequent nuclear meltdowns at Fukushima. I was there shooting a film for PBS Frontline, doing some stories for the PBS NewsHour. Fumio was my fixer, although I hate that term because that implies I'm a breaker. But seriously, there is no question I would not get very far as an English-speaking Western journalist in Japan without Fumio. I had read every year that on the anniversary of the crash of Japan Airlines Flight 123, that there is a solemn memorial service on the mountain where all those lives met their end. And I asked Fumio if she would go and report on what happens during these annual pilgrimages. She already knew all about it. If I say, even in Tokyo, I'm going up to Osaka Mountain, everybody would know that's the Japan Airlines crash site. The road up to the closest village, Uenomura, has so-called melody lines cut into the pavement. These are rumble strips, which, if you drive over them at just the right speed, plays an old Japanese folk song called Arashi Hina Matsuri, the Joyful Dolls Festival. Only in Japan, right? But there's nothing joyful about this journey. The crash site is very steep, rugged, remote, heavily wooded. Uenomura is the most sparsely populated village in Japan. The people who live up there are of hardy stock, for sure. Fumio says the scene today is impeccably curated, just like everything else in Japan. They have marked on the road pretty well inside the village how to get there. You park a car bottom of the hill, and then you start hiking into the trail, which is marked very well. Some of the steps are made with the nice wood and the handles made with some metal bars. It's not uh, difficult now to go up there, but it's a very steep hillside. She described a very moving hike up the mountain. There are grave markers, or boyo, 520 of them, at the approximate locations where the bodies were found. And they are decorated and adorned with small statues and Buddhas, Christmas decorations, origami cranes, flowers, and cups of water, too. Every trail has sort of stone or wooden plaque with the, some flowers. Those are the places where the bodies were found. And just after dark, just about the time of the accident, there's a ceremony with a moment of silence. It was just amazing scene. It's a very peaceful area. Peaceful, peaceful. 35 years ago, it was anything but that. It was the roar of a 747 flying nearly 300 miles an hour all four Pratt & Whitney engines producing every ounce of their 45,000-pound maximum thrust. And then what felt like an earthquake, followed by an intense inferno. People feel that uh, their family member were thirsty or pain with the burns. So they'd like to pour the water on their stones or the wooden plaques. Is there a sense that in some way the spirit of their loved one is there? They think their loved ones are still up there. She met an 84-year-old woman. She goes up to the mountain about three times a year to meet her daughter. 
She heard a similar story over and over again. Every family I talked to said, if I come up here, I'm with my father or my mother or my son or my daughter or my sister. Wow, it must be very moving being there. Were you surprised by it? It was quite a surprise for me. Every person I talk to has tears still talking about their loved ones. She was able to speak with Kuniko Miyajima. Her son Ken was nine. Like so many Japanese boys, he was baseball crazy. He was on his way to an annual high school tournament in Osaka. We were wondering to choose bullet train or airplane, but Ken wanted to fly on an airplane. Ken had been learning to swim that summer and had just recently done his first full length of a 25-meter pool. Kuniko and her husband were proud of him, and the trip to the tournament in Osaka was a reward and a rite of passage. It was his first flight on his own. He was very happy, jumping and very, very excited, looking at the photo of a jumbo. So his grandfather got him a window seat, 9K, so he could see Mount Fuji. We thought the flight was the safest transportation. August 12, 1985, the flight was at 6 p.m. In the afternoon, they drove Ken to Tokyo's Haneda Airport, about 40 minutes from their home in Tokyo. My husband and I took him to the airport. My younger brother's family was waiting for him in Osaka. It was only a 50-minute flight. They kissed him goodbye. From that moment, I have regretted that I was the one who put him on the airplane. I was only blaming myself. It was me who put him on the flight. So, Miles, yeah. this flight was supposed to be a 54-minute flight because Osaka is just 250 miles southwest of Tokyo. That's a pretty short flight. Yeah, it's a perfect, you know, city pair for the bullet train, right? And that was their go-to idea in the case of Ken. They thought that would be the best way to go, but he was fascinated by airplanes, so they made that decision. And there were 509 passengers on the plane. I think that's more passengers that have ever been on a plane that I've been on. Yeah, of course, it's 1985. In later years, the Airbus A380 has even bigger configurations, but at that time, these were special purpose airplanes that were made strictly for the Japanese market. The airline, Japan Airlines and ANA as well, ordered them from Boeing strictly for short domestic hops. They traded comfort and luxury for just a high seat count. The 747 normally would have fewer seats. It was the first jumbo jet, so already it had way more seats than the DC-8s or the 707s of the 60s. But it was designed for long-haul routes, and I don't know, in a standard configuration, maybe carried, what, 300, 350 people? Max, yeah. So they sacrificed the range of the airplane. I guess they took out some fuel capacity, and instead they put in more seats so they could haul more passengers. The high seat count and the repeated usage of this aircraft turns out to be a factor in the crash. Because these flew these airplanes on these short routes, they flew them more frequently. So instead of doing like one trip every other day because they're going from New York to Tokyo, they're doing several trips a day. A lot more cycles, as they're called in the aviation world. So this is not the typical 747 or 747 mission. So keep that in mind as we continue our discussion here. Now, most of the passengers were Japanese nationals, domestic flight, right? Many of them were traveling to visit family and friends for the Buddhist holiday of Oban, which, interestingly, is the festival of the dead. 
One of the passengers was very famous in Japan. Q Sakamoto was a singer. He's kind of a Japanese Sinatra. In 1963, he hit the charts in the U.S. with a song that Americans called Sukiyaki for no apparent reason except of cultural ignorance, I guess, because the real title is I Look Up As I Walk. And uh, Lars, these lyrics are a little haunting. I look up when I walk, counting the stars with tearful eyes, remembering those summer days but I am all alone tonight. Happiness lies beyond the clouds. Happiness lies above the sky. I mean, really, that's pretty, it's almost creepy in a way. Given what was about to happen, it sure is. So the crew, let's talk about them. This is as experienced a crew as you could imagine in any aircraft. The captain, 49-year-old Takahama Masami, 12,400 total flight hours, about 4,850 of those in the 747. He was really well regarded. He's what they call a check airman, which is the senior guy who checks out other people on the aircraft. And in fact, in this flight, this is unusual, he was sitting in the right seat, which is usually reserved for the co-pilot, the first officer. And he was evaluating his co-pilot to see if he was ready for promotion to be captain. So the first officer is 39 years old, Sasaki Yutaka, and he had about 4,000 total flight hours. About 2,650 of those were in the 747. Pretty good experience for a first officer. He was ready to be a captain. The flight engineer, 46-year-old Fukuda Hiroshi, also a veteran, 9,800 total flight hours, 3,850 in the 747. The combined flight time of this crew was 26,000 hours more than 11,000 of them in the 747 itself. So to say that's an experienced crew is almost an understatement. The flight engineer, that's a role that kind of became obsolete later on with newer jumbo jets were designed and put into service. Then we began to fly with two-person crews. But the 747, like some of its predecessors, like the 707, the DC-8, and even the 727, required a three-person crew. A big part of what they did was just kind of manage the fuel burn and all of that. All of that became much more automated in later aircraft, of course. Okay. So one of the factors in accidents a lot of time is the weather. What was the weather like? Perfect. It was just a nice summer day. A little hazy, but nothing to worry about. Pushback came at 6.05 p.m. Five minutes late in Japan. People would have been looking at their watch going, why are we so late? Short taxi, air traffic controllers cleared, Japan Airlines flight 123 for takeoff at 6.12 p.m. And they climbed to their assigned altitude of 24,000 feet. Now that's a low altitude for a 747. On the typical mission for the 747 that we talked about earlier, the long range mission, it would be probably flying in the high 30s. Start in the mid 30s and as they burned off fuel, get up into the high 30s, even 40, flight level 400 as pilots would call it. But this flight was such a short duration, they didn't have time to climb that high. So they went to 24,000. Yeah, that would have been typical for these domestic short range 747s in Japan. Up until this moment, everything was routine, by the book, the way pilots like it. But it wasn't long before things became very unroutine, and it's all captured by the cockpit voice recorder, which in this case is out there in the public domain. That's very unusual. The cockpit voice recorder captured this human drama in vivid detail. I want to warn our listeners, this is not easy to listen to. You're going to hear this thing play out, and it's very dramatic, a series of events that is gripping, to say the least. So at first, you're going to hear some radio transmissions between another aircraft and air traffic control. Don't let that distract you. But right after that, we're going to go inside the cockpit, and you're going to hear what happened when things went terribly wrong. Good evening, sir. 
Okay, there's the explosions. And all kinds of warning horns are blaring. One of the big things, of course, with the rapid decompression is they'd have a warning that the cabin altitude was not where it should be. It was much higher. In other words, the pressurization, we'll get more into pressurization later, is designed to keep enough air molecules in there for the people to breathe, but all of a sudden it wasn't adequate for that. They were getting warnings about that and some other things. The captain asks, has something exploded? And he says, Squawk 77. Explain that, Lars. There's a transponder on every commercial aircraft, and right now almost every aircraft, which provides a code that's visible on the air traffic controller's radar screen that uniquely identifies every aircraft that's in the sky. And there's a few codes reserved for special purposes, like hijack, and one of them is emergency. And that code is 7700. When you dial in that magic number, as a matter of fact, pilots are very careful not to do this one accidentally, because if you do it, Your radar return on the air traffic control radar screens would light up like a Christmas tree, making it very clear to air traffic controllers that something's up. This is particularly useful if you can't get on the radio to explain your problem. You immediately just dial that in, and air traffic control is going to start clearing some space in the air for you. And there's a bunch of codes like that for radio failure, hijacking, and this one is sort of the generic emergency. Something's very, very wrong. So they hear the explosions, and then they spend some time checking the landing gear doors, and I guess I don't really understand. No one seems to know what that was all about. Then the co pilot says, and this is where it gets to the meat of the matter shall we check hydro pressure, meaning hydraulics? the pressure in the hydraulic systems was dropping precipitously. And the captain concluded at this point, something exploded. They struggle to control the aircraft. Uh, Okay, it's been uh, one, two, three. uh, We just uh, have several little shots. We have a little bit of a So he's calling Tokyo, and he requests a return to Haneda Airport, which is where he departed from just a few minutes earlier. And that's normal. When something happens catastrophically, you want to go back to where you came from. Yeah, and it's not even the airport that actually is closest to where he is at that moment, but it does make sense, right? This is home base. You've got maintenance, you've got long runways, and you've got emergency equipment. So that's a good call, I think. One of the interesting things is the first thing they ask for is they want to go from 24,000 feet to 22,000 feet, which is still an altitude where you can't survive long on the air that you're breathing. It just doesn't have enough oxygen. And that's not standard operating procedure. Yeah, and this is, you know, a high time Czech airman, a very experienced 747 pilot and pilot in general. And this is just a memorized response, right? You lose pressure, you put on your oxygen mask, and you point the nose down. I assume you have a similar procedure in your airplane, Lars. Yeah, and then it's interesting. The reason this is in English is the international language of aviation is English. So wherever you go in the world, pilots and air traffic controllers communicate in English. We have a couple of bicycle mechanics in uh, Dayton to thank for that. So what you hear initially on the radio is them talking to air traffic control in English. And then, of course, as they communicate with each other on the flight deck, they're in their native tongue. Later, as things progress, air traffic control says, hey, guys, let's speak Japanese from here on out, which, of course, makes good sense when you're dealing with an emergency like this. Normally, we don't hear these cockpit voice recordings. Investigators only release transcripts. But in this case, the actual recording was leaked to the Japanese media. So it's out there. It's not fun to listen to, but there it is. So let's go back into the cockpit. You can really hear the struggle to control this crippled jet escalate. So the captain says, don't bank that much. I said, don't bank that much. Co-pilot says, yes, sir. Captain says, what's going on? 
The flight engineer says hydraulic pressure has been dropping. Captain says recover it. Co-pilot says it doesn't work. The captain asks the flight engineer, have all the hydraulic systems gone dead? His answer is yes. That's a really, really bad answer, by the way. There are how many redundant hydraulic systems? Three? Four. The there are four, four systems. So four. The aircraft isn't designed to fly if it has no hydraulic pressure. All of the flight control surfaces, the ailerons, the rudder, the elevators, are all controlled through hydraulics, like power steering in a car. It should be pretty much impossible in any scenario for all the hydraulic power to fail. Yeah, it's essential. You have to have at least one of those systems working. Hydraulics exploit Pascal's law, which states a pressure change at any point in a confined, incompressible fluid is transmitted throughout that fluid such that the same change occurs everywhere. You follow that one? Yeah, um, that's power steering. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a better way of thinking about it. It's really crucial that the hydraulic pipes filled with that fluid remain sealed tight. That's why you have four separate hydraulic systems in a 747. It's such an important system that has to be completely redundantly redundant. But you heard the crew of Japan Airlines Flight 123 just reached the horrible realization that all those redundancies had failed. They'd lost all their hydraulics. Let's get in the cabin now. The passengers. Grim scene there. Some panic, some prayers, and a resignation. All of this is unfolding at once. So that's the purser telling people, please be sure to put on your oxygen mask and place the elastic band around your head. And he says to all the cabin attendants, get your oxygen masks ready. This is just like the briefing you get ahead of every flight that you've been on, only this time it's for real. The masks did drop from the overhead compartment. He then plays a recording in Japanese and English just to put a fine point on all that he had just told them. Put out your signal. This is an emergency system. So meanwhile, up on the flight deck, the crew is engaged in this heroic effort to try and control the aircraft. They're pulling and turning the wheel, or the yoke as pilots call it. But here's the catch. Without hydraulics, they weren't doing anything. And there's no indication that the pilots ever understood this. So the yoke is connected to the control surfaces, the ailerons, the elevator, not through cables as an older or smaller aircraft, but through a hydraulic system. Without the hydraulic system, those controls aren't going to do anything. So the only thing they could do to go up, down, left, right, was to try to power the engines were generating. If they wanted to turn to the left, they'd add more power on the right side. To turn to the right, they'd add more power on the left. To go up, they'd add power on all engines. And there is no evidence they used this differential thrust as a way to try to steer the aircraft. They tried repeatedly to turn to the right and make a clockwise circuit back to Haneda Airport, but they weren't doing anything. They weren't moving those control surfaces. Without the ailerons or the rudder, the wings were rocking and the tail was wagging. This is called a Dutch roll. Without the control of the elevator, which controls pitch, it's like flying on a roller coaster in pattern. You apply power, the airplane starts to climb, it loses speed as it climbs, which causes the nose to fall, and now you're diving. Technically, pilots learn that this is called a fugoid, or a fugoid oscillation. It would do this over and over again. It would climb, lose airspeed, begin a descent, pick up airspeed, and climb. No one on board, including the flight crew, knew exactly what happened. But everyone on both sides of the cockpit door recognized this was a dire situation. Several people in the cabin, realizing where this likely was headed, grabbed whatever scrap of paper they could find to write what the Japanese call Isho notes. It's a last message to their families. 
52-year-old Hirotsuku Kawaguchi wrote a seven-page letter to his wife and children. Be good to each other and work hard. Help your mother. It's sad, but I'm sure I won't make it. Darling, it's too bad that this has happened. Goodbye. Please take good care of the children. It's 6.30 now. The plane is turning around and descending rapidly. I am grateful for the truly happy life I have enjoyed until now. These are pretty amazing. You're on an airplane. You've heard a big explosion. You know the crew is struggling to control it. You're going through these roller coaster excursions, literally zero G at the top of them, G forces at the bottom. The oxygen masks have dropped and you have the presence of mind and the discipline to get out seven pages of paper and write a note to your family. Yeah, <laughs> every time I read that, I, anyway, it's, it's tough. Kichi Matsumoto wrote this. Suddenly, there was an explosion, and the masks dropped. With the explosion, we began to fall. Be brave and live. Ryohei Murakami jotted notes with some timestamps. 1830. The plane is swaying a lot, left and right, descending rapidly. I might die. Everybody, please live happily. Goodbye, Sumiko, Miki, Kyoko, Kentaro. 1845. The plane is level and stable. There's little oxygen. I feel sick. Inside the plane, people are saying, let's do our best. I don't know what happened to the plane. 1846. I am worried about the landing. The stewardesses are calm. So it wasn't just the passengers that wrote these notes. One of the flight attendants, Yumiko Tsushima, was 29 years old. And in the neatest handwriting you can imagine, she wrote down everything she was trained to do in an emergency. Stay calm. Follow our instructions. Unfasten your safety belts. Take off high-heeled shoes. Brace yourselves. Don't take any baggage. Unfasten your safety belts. Jump. Jump and slide. Get away from the aircraft. Go to a safe area. You have to wonder how much her training kicked in there to just enumerate all of these things that in the best possible scenario, she hoped she could say. To get to the point where you could jump and jump and slide and have a chance of surviving must have been a pretty remote possibility even in her mind at that point. When you think of how she was trying to fulfill her duties in that horrible time, there's no other way to describe it except it's bravery. And selflessness, which in Japan is so important, uh, that's a big part of their culture. An architect, Kazuo Yoshimura, simply wrote, Please live bravely. Please look after the children. Put the mask over your face. Upstairs on the flight deck, there was no time to pen Isho notes. The crew was in the midst of an epic struggle to try and control the aircraft. But as this is happening, it becomes painfully clear the seasoned crew made critical mistakes that decreased their chances of survival. We'll get into that on our next installment of Black Box. I'm Lars Perkins. And I'm Miles O'Brien. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, do us a favor and subscribe, like, share, tell your neighbors.